Good afternoon and um, welcome to today's Downing Street press conference. I'm pleased to be joined today by Professor Jonathan Bantan. Let me start by updating you on the latest information from the government's COBRA data file. Through our monitoring and testing program, as of today, 2,219,281 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including a new record of 126,064 tests carried out yesterday. 233,151 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 3,446 cases since yesterday. 11,041 people are in hospital with COVID-19. That's down 14% from a week ago. And sadly, of those tested positive for coronavirus, 33,614 have now died. That's an increase of 428 fatalities since yesterday. This new figure does include all deaths in all settings, not just in hospitals. Our deepest sympathies go out to the families and friends as this nation battles to defeat the disease. Today, I'm going to set out how, whilst the country has been at a virtual standstill, this downtime has been used to fix and upgrade the nation's road and rail infrastructure, along with plans to help our economy bounce back. But before I set out today's transport announcements, let me briefly remind you of the government's roadmap out of this crisis. I'm going to have the first slide, please. As you know, uh, we've, been, we've established a new COVID alert system with five levels, based primarily on the R value and the number of cases. Throughout the lockdown, we've been at level four. Thanks to the British people, we've brought the R down and we can now begin moving carefully to level three. I have slide two. From this week, we're at step one on that slide, meaning that those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going back to work. You can now spend time outdoors and exercise as much as you like. You can meet one person who's not part of your household outside, provided you do stay two metres apart. Step two, from June the 1st, at the earliest and as long as it's safe, we aim to allow primary schools to reopen for some pupils in smaller class sizes, non-essential retail to start to reopen, and cultural and sporting events to take place behind closed doors and without crowds. And then on step three, no earlier than July the 4th, and again, only if the data says it's safe to do so, we aim to allow more businesses to open, including those offering personal care, those in the leisure sector, together with places of worship. Next slide, please. We can control this virus if we stay alert. But what does staying alert actually mean? Staying alert for the vast majority of people still means staying at home as much as possible and working from home if you can. But it also means limiting contact with other people, keeping your distance if you go out, washing your hands regularly, wearing a face covering in enclosed spaces where it's difficult to be socially distanced, for example, on public transport. And if you or anyone in your household has symptoms, you all need to self-isolate. Today, I want uh, to update you on the measures we're taking to speed up our economic recovery while keeping people safe. For two months, we've remained locked down, traveling as little as possible, and in doing so, the whole country has protected the NHS and helped reduce the number of COVID infections. But as we begin making tentative steps towards restarting our economy, and people in some sectors who can't work from home are beginning to return to workplaces, it is clear that transport has a critical role to play. Last Saturday, I explained why it's our civic duty to avoid public transport, if at all possible, because even when we have 100% of the services up and running, there may only be socially distanced space available for one in 10 passengers. Therefore, in order to help reduce crowding, we set out a two billion pound programme to put cycling and walking at the heart of transport, with 250 million pounds 
with that emergency money spending already underway. Over the past week, we followed this up by publishing three pieces of detailed guidance. First, for local authorities in England, explaining how they should prepare for significantly increased numbers of, of both cyclists and pedestrians. Next, for the transport sector to ensure that they provide safer services for those travelling and safer workplaces for their staff. And third, and most importantly, for passengers. We're asking the public to help ensure that the transport system does not become significantly overwhelmed by returning commuters. The guidance makes it clear that if you can't walk or cycle, but you do have access to a car, please use it, rather than travelling by bus, train or tram, especially where the public transport is liable to be overcrowded. And for those people who absolutely need to use public transport, it also explains how you can best protect yourself and those around you. In the coming weeks, as we carefully and cautiously restart sectors of our economy and people begin to travel once again, they should notice that whilst the country has been in downtime, with the roads and railways quite quiet, uh, we have been busy getting on with essential work, fixing the nation's infrastructure so we can uh, recover faster when the time comes. This upgrade programme, the kind of work that at any other time would cause inevitable disruption and service delays whilst costing the taxpayer more, has instead carried out in previously, previously unimaginable circumstances of a largely unused transport network. For example, we've completed 419 separate network rail projects over Easter, with a further 1,000 upgrades being carried out through, throughout the May bank holiday. Meanwhile, Highways England has been busy accelerating maintenance projects on the nation's roads. Last week, for example, we opened the vital A14 upgrade seven months ahead of schedule. This is a route normally used by 85,000 drivers daily, which will dramatically improve access to the UK's largest container port of Felixstowe and permanently boost the distribution of goods around the UK. As Northern Power Powerhouse Minister, uh, I can report that in the North we've delivered £96 million of rail infrastructure improvements during April. And throughout the country, we've accelerated maintenance projects on road and rail, whilst always sticking to Public Health England safety guidelines. So that altogether, Highways England has delivered over £200 million of upgrades, and Network Rail uh, has delivered £550 million worth uh, during April alone. I'd like to thank the Army of Transport and Construction Workers who've been grafting very hard throughout this lockdown. But to make sure that Britain is ready to bounce back from coronavirus, today I can announce nearly £2 billion to upgrade our roads and our railways, to put our transport infrastructure in the best possible shape and to get our economy growing once again. This package includes £1.7 billion for local roads, making journeys smoother and safer for drivers, hauliers, cyclists, motorcyclists, pedestrians and others. By filling millions of dangerous potholes, we can make our roads safer and encourage more people to cycle or even take part in the upcoming e-scooter trials, helping more people play our part in relieving public pressure on public transport. This investment will help fix damage caused by the winter flooding, repair roads and bridges, and fund numerous road improvement schemes. As more people become mobile again, we'll also be building a network of rapid charging stations for electric cars, including a big expansion of rapid charging facilities at motorway service stations, helping the country to lock in the dramatic air quality improvements we've experienced during the coronavirus lockdown. Amid all the sad news and the tragedy of loved ones we've lost, we somehow managed to do things in weeks that would normally take years. Building new hospitals, moving public services online, making instant reforms and fast-track new laws, extraordinary changes in the way that employers and employees work, effectively taking swathes of the economy online almost overnight. Now, 
we want to ensure that we can maintain this momentum. In building, if building a new hospital takes just two weeks, why should building a new road still take as long as 20 years? If GP surgeries can move online, why are most rail passengers still travelling on cardboard tickets? We must exploit our newfound capacity to respond at pace and apply it to rapidly improving our infrastructure. And we must examine why it is that bureaucratic bindweed makes British infrastructure some of the costliest and slowest in Europe to build. Because whilst many will continue to work from home after this crisis, both the long-term transport trend and the pressing need for communities to level up across the country dictate that infrastructure will be even more important in stimulating our recovery and securing supporting new jobs. So by combining fast home internet access with vastly upgraded transport connections, we can help revive many of our small and medium-sized towns, which over the decades have been left behind. This has been a devastating start to the year, not just for Britain, but for the world. And we are only at phase one of that recovery plan. But we all know that it is our uh, reaction to adversity that will ultimately define how we recover. We must harness our approach to tackling the pandemic and apply it to rebuilding our own infrastructure with the same swift action, innovation and collective determination that has characterised us over the past few weeks. And in doing so, we can emerge stronger. I'd like to turn now to Jonathan Van Tam for the data figures. Thank you, Secretary of State. Good afternoon to you all. And um, I'm going to go through the, today's slides, um, beginning with some uh, new data. Um, these are social distancing data. They've been um, collected by the Office for National Statistics, and they represent the period from the 24th of April to the 3rd of May this year. And what they show to you quite clearly is that 80% um, of adults um, in Great Britain only left their homes for the permitted reasons, if at all. 91% of adults avoided contact with vulnerable people. And compared with 12% last year, 44% of employed adults worked from home in that period. So you can see that there have been very dramatic and very important changes that the British people have made that have contributed to where we are now in terms of being able to begin easing the social distancing restrictions that we've been under for so many weeks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this slide um, shows you in a bit more detail um, testing and new cases um, across the UK from the period 6th of April on the left of the graphs through to the 14th of May on the right. And the top array in pink um, is testing. Um, please bear in mind that some people, a very small proportion, will have been tested more than once. But nevertheless, on the 14th of May, 126,000 um, tests were recorded, uh, were, were performed. Um, this is a new record. Um, it's um, goes on the back of um, over 2.2 million tests um, delivered in total. And in terms of confirmed cases, um, on the 14th of May, there were 3,446 confirmed cases um, against a total of 233,151. If you look carefully at the bottom graph, um, the green graph, um, you can now see um, a gradual downward trend in the number of confirmed cases. Next slide, please. These are new data again, uh, recently published by the Office for National Statistics, based upon um, a survey of households that will eventually uh, get to a total size of 10,000 um, households surveyed. What it shows you are data from the 27th of April through to the 10th of May. Um, and these are estimates based upon the sample, but these are estimates for all of England. And the estimate is that in that time period, 148,000 um, uh, pe 
people were infected with COVID-19. That is 0.27% of the English population, which is just under um, three people infected in every 1,000. So that is really now um, quite a low level of infection in the community that is being picked up through this survey. And this survey will be repeated regularly. Over time, it's going to be able to show us regional trends and regional data, and the data will feed into the Joint Biosecurity Centre to help us keep a very close eye on COVID-19 as we move forwards. Next slide, please. I'm turning now to um, the data from hospitals. Um, the upper curve <coughs> shows um, new daily admissions from the 24th of March through to the 12th of May. Um, the bottom curve shows the, per the percentage of critical care beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. And there are four traces there covering um, the uh, five traces, I beg your pardon, um, covering four traces, covering the uh, four nations of, uh, of, of the UK. What you can see on both of those slides are now long, steady declines in admissions and the proportion of critical care beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. This is clearly extremely good news and shows that the pressure on hospitals is now beginning to ease. Over the page, please. Thank you. Um, this further data shows the total number of people in hospital uh, with COVID-19 across the UK. And um, the general pattern across the UK, you can see now, is clearly downwards. Um, there's been a 14% drop in the total number of people in hospital since last week. And again, this is moving in the right direction. Next slide, please. This slide um, sadly shows um, deaths due to COVID-19 um, confirmed with a positive test right across the UK, beginning at the 14th of March on the left of the slide and moving to the 14th of May. And um, there have been 428 um, deaths with a confirmed test um, reported on the 14th of May. But um, as importantly now, if you look at the slide itself, and look at the yellow curve picking out the seven-day rolling average. This decline is now continuing and it is sustained, which again is a very positive sign indeed. Thank you, Secretary Stewart. Thank you very much, um, Jonathan. We turn now to uh, questions first from the members of the public. Uh, Helen from Chesham. My son is due to start the final year of his engineering degree at Durham in October, which cannot be done purely online. He has to start paying rent on his student house in July and take out the student loan of £9,250 in August. If lectures move online, he will be thousands of pounds worse off and will also miss out on the student experience. There was no mention of students or universities in the government's plan to rebuild on Monday. What is the government's plan for students and universities this autumn? Thank you. Well, Helen, thank you very much. We certainly share uh, an interest. I also have uh, a son at university wondering about exactly the same issues. And that, that of course, comes down to what happens with the uh, pace of, from the charts that the professor was just showing us of the decline in this um, disease. Uh, and, of course, it will be the case that if we can get those numbers down, then all different parts of the economy will start to be able to reopen. Um, I think it's too early uh, to say, uh, but the um, Education Secretary will be returning to this subject and will be providing us all uh, with uh, further guidance. Uh, and uh, uh, like you, Helen, I'm uh, very interested to hear it when it comes. Um, there is something we can all do in the meantime, uh, which is when we say stay alert, ensure that we do have that social distancing in place, particularly as some of the tentative first baby steps in unlock, unlock uh, start to happen. Um, so I think it is a wait and see, uh, but uh, we're absolutely aware of the concerns and we want to make sure that we beat this virus in a way that can allow parts of uh, society, including education, higher and further education, to get going again. Can I turn to uh, Naomi from uh, Farnborough? And this is going to be a written question. 
Millions of people have had their operations and other hospital procedures postponed indefinitely. Can the government say when elective surgery and other delayed treatments uh, will recommence? Well, yes, Naomi, it's definitely um, the case that we want the NHS, which, uh, as Jonathan was just demonstrating, has capacity uh, increasingly coming back into it because the number of people in hospital for COVID has been uh, coming down, uh, to uh, be able to take up uh, routine uh, uh, operations, uh, many of which haven't stopped, but some of which I know that the Health Secretary has referred to um, specifically, and he'll be saying more about that soon. I don't know, Jonathan, there's anything that you wanted to add from a medical point of view? Only really to say that um, we absolutely understand that the National Health Service is not a COVID treatment service. It has had to focus on that in the last few months, but we're very conscious, everybody in health is conscious of the fact that as soon as is physically and humanly possible, um, services must be restored to normal. But that takes time, and it has to be done at a paced, measured, safe way. I mean, it is worth noting that in no time has the NHS become overwhelmed. We've got the Nightingale hospitals. We've managed to increase the capacity, and the NHS has done a phenomenal job of that. So, um, and we, as, as uh, Jonathan rightly says, we want to make sure that it is there for everything, and we also encourage people to continue contacting their GP or dialing 111 to make sure that they're getting the support that they require from the NHS. Can we turn now to questions from the media? Um, Alison Holt of the BBC. Secretary of State, uh, there's growing anger amongst people within the care sector about what they see as the ongoing slowness of the government's response to um, their needs, their problems. They are still waiting, for instance, for details of the infection control plan that was announced yesterday. It's two months into the pandemic. What would you say to reassure them that this is going to change? And also a question from my sports colleagues for Professor Van Tam. You've been involved in talks with Premier League players. How likely is it to be safe enough to return to competitive football by June the 12th? Alison, thank you very much indeed. Uh, look, with um, care homes, they are actually sort of specialists um, in infection control. That's something that care homes, um, I understand, often routinely uh, are the front line of, of, of um, handling, often more so than, than hospitals. Uh, and many of them, uh, will, all of them, will be knowing exactly what to do. And, and testament to that is that um, in, the, in the majority, the vast majority of care homes, uh, COVID-19 hasn't um, been reported um, at all. However, it certainly is the case, and we've seen these figures uh, from the uh, WHO, who say that uh, in Europe uh, as a whole, uh, over 50% of deaths have taken place in care homes. Not so uh, in uh, English care homes, the, the figures being about 25% uh, overall. Um, but it is absolutely essential that they are provided with every provision. I just want to give you an example of that. Um, care homes, often privately owned, uh, were actually always buying their own PPE. That's how it's always uh, worked. The government stepped in very quickly to, uh, although, as you know, well covered, um, massive global shortage, helped to provide PPE uh, to care home with uh, millions of, of pieces um, delivered. So there's been a, a sort of big national effort um, to, to assist them. And I know that um, the, the Health Secretary will be saying uh, more about that um, soon. Uh, but uh, I, I don't want to sort of um, underestimate the extraordinary work that's gone in uh, to care homes to make sure that most of them have indeed remained COVID free uh, in the meantime as well. Um, I'll go to Jonathan and I'll invite you to come back. Thank you, on, uh, football. Yes, on, on football. Um, as you know, the overall approach um, with easing social distancing has been one that has been tentative, measured, slow and stepwise. And that is exactly um, the plan that is um, underway for all of elite sport, not just football, that there will be um, small, carefully measured, stepwise approaches to seeing what can be achieved safely. Um, the first of those is really um, to return to safe training, still observing social distancing. And um, measures are you know, taking place, and, uh, plans are taking place at quite some depth um, to be ready to do that. Um, and that will be a stepwise thing. We will have to see how that goes before it is time to move on or even think about moving on to the return of 
competitive football matches, um, as you have um, outlined in your question. So I think, you know, we have to be slow, we have to be measured. Alison, I'm just going to give you the opportunity to come back on either of those. Yes, if I could. One, one more question on care homes and the care sector. In Scotland, care home residents that have tested COVID positive will now have to have two negative tests before they can return to that care home. Is that something that's going to be introduced in England? Uh, it's probably more a question for the, for the medical experts and Public Health England than me. Um, I did just want to mention uh, in regard to testing though, um, that it's important to know that everybody in a care home, uh, that doesn't matter whether that is um, a care home worker or a resident, and it doesn't matter whether they are uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic, can now um, be tested. And there are different routes to testing, one of which is there are now 116, is the latest figure, 116 mobile testing units, which can actually physically, uh, as required or if required, uh, go to a care home as well, which is um, helpful um, helpful to know. But I think on the sort of detailed what the medical advice would be, again, I'll turn to the professor. Yeah. So I'd just say there's a, an absolutely enormous effort now to um, increase the amount of daily tests performed in care homes and testing is part of the discharge process um, before patients are discharged from NHS facilities to care homes. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. I'll turn now to Tom Clark at ITV. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, my question relates to antibody tests that have been in the headlines today. Uh, the Prime Minister described antibody tests as game-changing. Is that still the government's position? And if so, when can we expect to see their game-changing potential actually deployed in this epidemic? And how are you going to prioritise those? Will they go straight to care homes or frontline healthcare for mm. care workers first? Uh, thanks, Tom. I, look, I think, first of all, I'll, I'll hand over to Jonathan for the, the, the medical side of this. But um, I think it's very exciting that there's a, uh, a very, very reliable, possibly even a 100% reliable um, antibody test. That's the test, of course, that shows whether or not you've actually had coronavirus in the past rather than currently and have therefore developed the antibodies. Um, it's very good news, particularly if it transpires uh, that um, this makes you uh, immune, at least for a period, from getting coronavirus again. And I think therein is the question mark within uh, your question. I'll come back to you uh, afterwards, but I'm going to ask uh, Professor Jonathan Van Tam just to address that point. Yeah. So thank you for the question. You're absolutely right. We have been waiting um, for a really good antibody test um, to be ready. Um, there are now at least two available. Um, one of those um, has um, uh, received its CE mark on the 28th of April, the Roche test. Um, it has been validated by Public Health England on the 7th of May, and I anticipate that it will be rapidly rolled out in the days and weeks to come, as soon as it is practical to do so. I also anticipate that the focus will be on the National Health Service and on carers in the first instance. And it has taken time. What we required was a test that was highly specific. And to, to explain to people what that means, it means that um, the chances of a false positive are extremely low with this test. And I'm sure you can understand that if we had used a test where it was possible of giving a false positive result, and therefore saying to people, you have antibodies to COVID-19, when in fact you don't, that would have been very undesirable indeed. So absolutely, this is a good test that will stand us in good stead moving forwards. And I think it will be incredibly important as the days, weeks and months go by. Now, there are some science pieces that need to go along with that. And please remember that this is a virus that emerged in December. So the totality of human learning on this virus has been in the last five months. Um, that's not long to get to know all the ins and outs of a virus. And one of the things um, that we've needed to know is after infection and recovery, whether there is an antibody response. And it's clear that in most cases there is. But you can't just apply this test. You have to wait um, at least 14 days, preferably 28 days, 
after, after the infection in order to be sure to pick up the antibodies if they are there. The next thing to say is it's going to take us time to understand whether the antibodies in all cases protect against infection. And you can't speed up the answer to that. You have to carefully study people who've recovered, people who you know have got antibodies, and follow them and track them and see if they become reinfected. And over time, hopefully, you get the answer that they're not. But that is data that has to be gathered over time. And then finally, if you understand that antibodies do protect you against reinfection from this disease, the final science question is, how long into the future do the antibodies last for? It is not automatic that by any means that these are going to be lifelong. Um, we just don't know. We'll have to take people with antibodies and measure them over time to understand how long the antibodies stay in the body. And that is something that I'm afraid scientists all around the world have to be patient about and have to wait for the answers. Now, those answers may come from other parts of the world. They may come from the UK, where there's enormous efforts being put into what we call long-term serology surveys to understand all of this. But it isn't something that you can compress through time in a science sense, no matter how hard you try. Um, we just have to learn as we go along. But the good news is we do now have antibody tests that we absolutely can rely on. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So, Tom, I think to answer your question, if all of those things end up being yes, and it actually provides that kind of immunity, then, then for, for, for sure it would be um, game-changing because it would enable us to do things in terms of um, releasing lockdowns that wouldn't be possible otherwise. I think your second part of your question was about quantity. I don't know the exact answer to that. Hundreds of thousands, uh, if not millions, will be uh, the answer, uh, I'm sure, but it's a very positive uh, development, and we're uh, delighted that it's happened. Did you want to come back at all, Tom? May I be permitted just one, one follow-up? Yes, just as I understand it, there are other tests, and uh, uh, Professor Van Tam just alluded to that, not just Roche, I believe Abbott Laboratories have an effective antibody test as well. I'm getting the impression the government is doing a deal with Roche. Is that an ex are we having an exclusive relationship here, or are we going to try and spread our bets, given the uncertainties that still remain in terms of the science? And secondly, have these tests been validated against people with very low levels of antibodies, these asymptomatic cases? Because that's the game-changing element, is how many people out there have actually had COVID-19? We won't know that. We can't spot people with asymptomatic. So on that second point, uh, I know the tests were carried out at Port and Down um, uh, by PHE. Um, Jonathan may know more about it. On the first point, of course, we'll want to get um, as much, as many tests as possible. We've never restricted ourselves uh, with that regard, and we've, we've looked at other antibody tests before this, which actually just didn't stack up once we'd uh, tested them, uh, including some very uh, early on. And unless you have that 100% accuracy, uh, they're not helpful in individual cases, though I think it is true to say that you can have less than 100% accuracy, accuracy and come up with a, usual, a useful survey of uh, a wider percentage and come up with statistically useful information. It's not the same as having what appears to be there uh, now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so I think to, to these questions we'll have to wait and see um, the answer. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on the um, testing side of things. Well, so, so on the, on the contracting point doctors aren't told that kind of thing and I'm sure I couldn't talk about it anyway because it's um, undoubtedly commercially sensitive. Um, I do, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist not a laboratory scientist so I think the question you're asking is is there a kind of threshold below which the tests cannot pick up a very faint signal and I don't know the answer to that. I think the Secretary of State is right that does not change their value in understanding what is going on in the British population and how many of us um, have now been exposed to this disease, been infected, even if we may not have known it at the time, and now have antibodies. And that's going to be a critical piece of um, understanding as we go forwards, because we're going to have to live with this virus for quite some time, um, certainly until a vaccine comes along. Tom, thanks very much. It's a fascinating and extremely important and actually quite hopeful uh, area, given the news uh, on that antibody uh, today. I'd like to turn now to uh, Charlotte Ivers of Talk Radio. 
Thank you, Secretary of State. NHS England were due to publish some data today on the number of urgent operations cancelled in March 2020. That data release has itself been cancelled, and I'm quoting from the gov.uk website here. It says, these statistics will not be collected and published for the period due to the coronavirus illness and the, due to the need for capacity to release capacity across the NHS. So can we be absolutely clear here? Does the government know how many urgent operations were cancelled in March 2020? Thanks very much, Charlotte. Um, simple answer, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it uh, is the case that in all, in all these situations, we're trying to get data out as, uh, as much as possible, both as a government, we found that to be a useful process to uh, just put data out there so people can analyze it. Um, but also, of course, people like the Office of National Statistics who look after the nation's statistics uh, and the NHS who have a very big um, statistics um, uh, uh, function. Uh, I, I guess from uh, your description, it's the first I've heard of it about it, but I guess from your description, it is um, just a, a prioritization um, issue. Uh, and uh, actually, it, with your permission, I'll ask the health secretary uh, when I speak to him and make sure we specifically get you uh, an answer um, to your question, unless Jonathan knows anything off the top of I his head. I don't have that answer. No, I'm afraid I don't know enough about the way that the statistics are, uh, are, are delivered within the NHS to answer the question. I'll just give you a chance to come back, Charlotte, in case you've got a follow-up on that. Absolutely. I, I think, yes, from, um, from what's on the gov.uk website, it does seem to be a case of prioritisation, but obviously these are urgent operations. Mm. And therefore, I'm, I'm su surprised to see the government hasn't taken it as a priority to assess how many have actually been cancelled. Um, so, Charlotte, what I can certainly tell you is I will um, check in with the health secretary immediately after this and we'll uh, find out uh, what we know about it. Um, it, there, it will, as, as you rightly say, possibly be a question of prioritisation or, as in other cases um, during coronavirus, um, the NHS um, having to well, put its resources elsewhere in order to get things going. Um, that said, I, I'd be surprised if we haven't got a pretty um, firm uh, knowledge on uh, the number of operations. I do see um, statistics mentioned mostly by the media on this all the time. Uh, let's find out the answer for you, you and you can rebroadcast it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the question. Can I turn to Jim Pickard of the FT? Jim. Secretary of State, back in March you bailed out almost the entire railway industry. But Transport for London is running out of money fast and Sadiq Khan, the mayor, has said that they're basically hours away from some major cash crunch. I understand you're close to some kind of rescue deal for them, but they're saying that they need money not just for the spring, the summer, the autumn, but they need money possibly for several years if social distancing is to remain on the tube and on London buses. Is that something that you can commit to? And my second question for Professor Van Tam um, the government has drawn up plans to introduce quarantine for people coming to the UK from anywhere in the world for two weeks. But under one proposal, France would be excluded. Um, as a scientist, do you think there's any scientific rationale for that idea of excluding the French? Jim, thanks very much. Um, look, on TfL, and actually this applies, of course, wider across our entire network, as you point out right at the beginning of this crisis, we had a rescue package for all of the railways. We subsequently also helped the uh, bus companies, trams, uh, ferries, and many others to uh, work through this crisis, not least to ensure that critical workers were able to get to places like the NHS, social care, and all the other important work that's been going on. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, we are now in a situation where I am optimistic of uh, having a, um, a solution with TfL and, uh, and the Mayor uh, of London. Um, it, we don't know the answer to the second part of your question there, which is, well, what would happen if this lasted for very much longer uh, and it went on for, you know, m more than, you know, a few months? Of course, we're all working to make sure that we get rid of the virus uh, or get rid of it as much as possible, uh, which is why I think the data that uh, the Professor Jonathan Van Tam was just showing uh, was so, uh, uh, so, so um, good to see that the number of infections seem to be uh, coming down. Um, but we don't know what the long term will be. Uh, however, I am confident in the short term, um, TfL, it's London Underground, and the, the buses and indeed 
the trains and buses throughout the rest of the country will continue to run, and I'm encouraging the mayor to make sure we get that back to 100% very quickly as people are starting to travel more. It's very, very important, as I was saying in my comments earlier, that we do not have overcrowding. And then I think there's a question on the sort of epidemiology of um, uh, 14 days isolation. Which yeah. I'll hand over. So um, thank you for the question about quarantine. Um, as I understand it, discussions are still ongoing about what the final shape of um, measures at the UK borders um, will look like. And uh, that's not for me to comment while those discussions are still going on. But you asked a question about the science and about quarantine making sense. Given that the incubation period of this illness is um, up to 14 days, then asking people who cross the UK border to um, stay at home for 14 days to self-isolate means that they can't develop symptoms or become infectious just before the development of symptoms and be out there at large in our community. So that's scientifically very important. And where quarantine and when quarantine makes most sense scientifically is when the incidence, the level of disease, the level of new cases in the receiving country, in this case the UK, is low and it makes most sense in terms of travellers coming from areas where the incidence is high. Jim, do you want to come back on either of those points? Just on the, on the TfL point, um, are you expecting the Mayor to introduce higher fares as part of the TfL rescue package? And, and do I understand it, Professor Van Tan, that you're saying that because we have a higher infection rate than France, then that's not really a problem? In which case, why wouldn't we apply the same rule to other countries with a lower infection rate? Um, on the first point, I can actually comment on the second one, if you like, as well. Um, on, on higher fares, um, look, it's very important, I think, in um, providing a, a rescue package for TfL uh, that the London Mayor can work with, that we don't end up in a situation where people from um, outside the capital are um, unfairly carrying the burden. And by what, which I mean, sadly, I have to stand up and do them um, uh, uh, each year, um, fares do end up having to rise with inflation, otherwise everyone knows there's less money going into the system. Uh, and if you have consistent fare freezes, it means that um, more money isn't going into the system um, and you can't then have an unfair settlement where other uh, British taxpayers are effectively uh, bailing out the system, albeit that the system in this case uh, is in trouble because clearly of uh, coronavirus. Um, so there is the right balance to be made to answer your question uh, head on. Um, and uh, in, in terms of um, the 14 days and what happens at our borders, um, to, to pick up on your last point, which is probably better aimed at me, um, but we're working on the detail of this. Let's wait till uh, we've seen it. As a principle, though, it seems fair and right that if we're asking the British people to stay at home and uh, you know, make such huge sacrifices in their own lives, then we would expect anybody coming back to the country to do uh, the same thing or visiting the country uh, to do the same thing with some limited uh, exceptions and uh, for the reasons that uh, Jonathan was explaining it makes sense to do that as our own level of infections come under control not to effectively re-import it and of course now we have things like the testing and tracking uh, capacity uh, to do that uh, it's worth mentioning actually um, that in terms of the testing and tracking app I know that the uh, health secretary will say more about it um, shortly um, but there are now over half the residents of the Isle of Wight where this is being tested out who have downloaded um, the tracking uh, app for the first time, or in total rather, the actual number is 72,300, um, which means that over half of Isle of Wight have downloaded that. And one of the things we'll be asking people to do at the border when they come in is to download the app and provide us with contact details so that we know where people are. So I think it's a very sensible, proportionate approach to making sure we don't uh, re-import a problem uh, once we've got these numbers under control, particularly now we have that test and tracking capability which wouldn't have existed um, some time ago. Jim, thank you very much uh, indeed. I'm going to turn to John Stevens of the Daily Mail. John. Uh, thank you, Transport Secretary. Um, you're asking people to use cars instead of public transport. Aside from road up upgrades that are likely to take some time, what are you going to do to help motorists now? Could local councils be asked to scrap parking charges or get rid of parking restrictions? Could people get help to buy a car? Thanks, John. Um, first of all, um, it, it is an unusual situation for a, a transport secretary to, to be in, to 
actively ask people to avoid, particularly at busy times, or actually at busy times, uh, public transport. And it's very, very important that we get this right, otherwise that would become a major way to spread the disease if people can't maintain social distancing. So yes, the car, uh, if you can't use other active forms of transport, like cycling or, or walking, um, then the car is certainly uh, the, the, the option that comes about. One of the things, as I mentioned in my opening comments, that we've enjoyed during this, um, uh, a few things, it's been better during the lockdown, has been the air quality, um, which has gone up dramatically. Uh, and we want to maintain some of that. And so incentives for people to, uh, over time, switch to electric vehicles, the money that I announced um, both on Saturday when I spoke from here, but also today for upgrading electric charging, uh, is really uh, important because um, it helps people feel comfortable and not experience range anxiety uh, if they get an, an electric car, which um, which helps. But also in terms of cars, um, the pothole work has been going on throughout, um, but there will be uh, an expansion of that to fix uh, our roads, to make it better for drivers. Uh, of course, fuel um, charges have come down, the cost of petrol has come down uh, quite a lot during this um, crisis. And you're right about um, the balance of parking charges uh, and different zones, um, because there are times now where we're literally uh, encouraging people to drive perhaps close to, but maybe not right into, perhaps a town or city that they work in, and find a place to park. So we're working not just with local authorities on this, John, but also with um, some uh, large entertainment venues who have car parks which aren't being used at the moment, uh, and looking at all those possibilities. So it's, it's a very good point. I'll just come back to you, John. Uh, yeah, I just want to ask a quick question about holidays. Um, when the hospitality industry is allowed to start opening up again, um, do you think holidays outside, such as camping or caravanning, could be seen as carrying less risk than staying in hotels, and could they be allowed to open sooner? Well, I'll certainly ask uh, Jonathan to ask part, answer part of that, but on the broader point, just so we're clear where we are today and where we're, we hope we're heading. Um, today, uh, although you can now travel any distance, for example, to go and exercise, you must still um, stay in your own home uh, in the, uh, at night. Um, so you can't at the moment book holiday accommodation or, or bed and breakfast or stay over anywhere. Um, but over a period of time, and I set out in that slide earlier, phases one, two and three, um, we are saying that we will look to uh, unlock if the data says it's possible. And if not, we'll have to stop, I'm afraid. But if we can, we'll unlock. And at that point, um, uh, my impression is that outdoors actually, as things stand at the moment, is a lesser risk than indoors. But right now, I'm going to stop and defer to an expert professor. Yes, thank you. So the two epidemiological concepts that are important in keeping the infection rate down is um, staying within household groups and uh, minimising the contact between households. Um, that's one point. Um, it is absolutely um, an aerobiological truism that outdoor environments are much less risk than indoor environments. But of course, that will need some careful thinking about because um, sharing a tent is a small enclosed space or can be a small enclosed space with generally poor, con poor conditions of ventilation, and I guess it depends who you're sharing it with. Same for a caravan. So it's not as straightforward as it might sound, indoors, outdoors, hotels, campsites. It's a little more complex than that, and it will take some um, careful thought. And um, now you've mentioned it, I'll begin to give that a bit of careful thought. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And thank you, John, and actually also your readers for their tremendous work on uh, PPE and the campaign uh, that you've been running, which has been greatly appreciated. Can I uh, turn to uh, William Telford from Plymouth Live? William. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the Secretary of State a couple of questions uh, specific to Plymouth, and following up on the last uh, question on the hospitality industry. Um, I don't know how much you know about Plymouth, but 2020 was set to be a very big year for us with the Mayflower 400 celebrations. Those have all now been postponed. Um, the city has suffered a £71 million uh, loss in tourism in just the time of the pandemic. Um, it's lost £20 million from loss of student revenue. And um, the city council is saying it is now set to lose £50 million from lost income and increased costs. Um, this puts our economy of this city in some somewhat uh, a state of jeopardy. 
Um, it's a city that already has some of the worst deprivation areas in the southwest, if not the whole country, and a history of underfunding. So I wonder if the Secretary of State can tell us, is there anything you can do or are planning to do to specifically help cities such as Plymouth that have unique problems? And secondly, um, in light of what the French Prime Minister said today about restarting domestic holidays in France from July and August, and bearing in mind the problems we've got with um, the hospitality sector here, could we expect a similarly clear announcement before July, July the 4th? And will there be any sort of support package expressly for hospitality? Thank you very much uh, indeed for those questions, uh, William. Um, so I think Plymouth is actually, um, like many areas, um, experiencing um, the worst of the coronavirus. So it's um, clearly um, decimated things like planned celebrations, and I was aware uh, of the one that was planned for uh, this year. Um, I did check before seeing you were coming on, and I know that the government's business support package uh, in Plymouth has allocated £47 million pounds, um, to Plymouth uh, and has also paid uh, over 3,200 grants, totaling over £39 million pounds, um, to uh, organisations there. Also, um, you will recall um, from other ministers saying it, we're allocating £3.2 billion uh, pounds of additional funding to local uh, governments, and I make that point to address your wider issue of towns and places like Plymouth, cities like Plymouth, um, and uh, to respond to the coronavirus, of which uh, Plymouth has received £15.7 million pounds, uh, of that money uh, to date. Um, on your second point, um, look, France, as I was talking to my uh, opposite uh, number uh, last night, Jean-Baptiste uh, Debarge, and we were having this discussion, France is um, probably... Uh, two or three weeks ahead of where the UK was, or I'll check this with uh, Jonathan, into um, this uh, virus, into the crisis. And so they've been making decisions at every stage a little bit uh, ahead of us. Um, it's unknown because we will want to get through those uh, phases that I described on the uh, slide before. We know that it, these things can't come before, uh, we've said not before July the 4th, phase three. Uh, which w opens a much wider potential, um, but we do need to make sure um, that the R rate and the number of cases in community and in society, it is a level that where we can uh, unlock before we can do that. And I'll just, because it's an epidemiological question, also throw it over to Jonathan. Well, I don't think I've really much to add other than that the landmass in France is clearly larger um, for a fairly similar population size and population density is going to be um, much less in France as a whole outside of the cities, and that uh, undoubtedly um, is the kind of difference that will need to be thought about very carefully before making too many international comparisons. John, thank you. William, um, thank you uh, very much indeed. It brings us to the end of our questions. I was just going to wrap up by saying it is clearly important if we want to, as so many of those questions request, to get to the next phases and unlock other parts of the economy, uh, that we all continue to stay alert. And staying alert means remembering to go back to all the things that we were being told about at the, at the beginning, like washing your hands, carrying hand san sanitizer, and making sure that you stay two metres apart. And if anyone, you or anybody else in your household is ill, please remember uh, to stay uh, isolated and at home uh, for 14 days. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Jonathan. Thanks for today. <laughs>